We're going to be covering chapter 11 out of uh, Welding Principles and Practices by Ed, Edward R. Bonart. And before we get started on that, I want you to look at this. Uh, Weld 1755, this is how we want you to take your written exams. Um, this chapter, you have four written exams in this, uh, chapters 11, 12, 1, and 2. I don't want you to start with chapter 1. I want you to start with chapter 11, the one that we're recording right now. Uh, shielded metal arc welding principles. The reason I want you to start with this chapter is because I'm going to cover all the basics about the equipment, how it works and everything like that. Um, we're not really going to touch on the on the power supplies too much, but uh, enough that you, uh, uh, if you have any questions, of course, we'll, we'll, we'll answer them. It'll kind of give you an overview of, of the power supplies. Uh, and, but when we're done covering the material in the book, I'm going to go over, I'm going to show some slides on um, the advantages of shielded metal arc welding, the limitations of shielded metal arc welding, some of the discontinuities and defects. Now, those are two words that you should be familiar with. Everybody knows what a defect is, right? If you have too much undercut or you have porosity and there's too much of it, that can be a defect. If there's not too much of it, it's just a discontinuity. It's an interruption in, in the uniform nature of the material, but it's not so bad that it's a defect. So we're going to cover some of those things. Every one of the welding, major welding processes has advantages and limitations and uh, problems that are associated with, with that process. So we're going to cover the ones that are on, on shielded metal arc welding. Where did my little clicker go? Aha, little devil. Okay, so here in the opening paragraph of your book, it says shielded metal arc welding. It's abbreviated SMAW. You have to know that abbreviation. Um, let me read, read what it says here. It says SMAW is manual arc welding in which the, the heat of welding is generated by an electric arc established between a flux covered consumable metal rod called the electrode and the work. For this reason, the process is also called stick electrode welding. Don't really, th that's, that's really not a term that you hear very much, but, but some people will call it stick welding. Uh, the proper term is shielded metal arc welding, so that's the one I'd like you to use. The combustion and decomposition of the electrode creates a gaseous shield that protects the electrode tip, the weld puddle, the arc, and the highly heated work from atmospheric con contaminations. So the, the flux on our welding electrodes actually have five functions, which I'll get into in chapter 12. But for our purposes, all you have to need to know really is that when you strike the arc, you want to maintain a, 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 a real short arc so that the gaseous shield has an opportunity to envelop everything and protect it from the air. If air gets to it, you're going to have porosity and other problems. So that's what you need to take away from that. Um, Go over to, uh, to where it says process capability. Shielded metal arc welding is one of the most widely used of the various electric arc welding processes. Uh, rather than replacing shielded market metal arc welding, the popularity of the other processes is causing the total amount of welding performed to increase. So SMAW hasn't decreased in popularity, it's just that some other processes have, be has become, uh, have become more uh, prevalent. It says according to a recent market study, of equipment and process usage among the industrial market segments, SMAW represents 42% of the welding. GMAW, FCAW is 34, GTAW is 13, SAW is 9, and others 2% of the total welding. There's five major metal joining processes. We call them the big five, okay? The big five in welding. SMAW, G-M-A-W, this is what your high school would call MIG. F-C-A-W, this is flux core. And there's actually two types. There's inner shield that doesn't use a shielding gas, and there's dual shield that uses a shielding gas in addition to the, to the flux that's in the wire. Then there's G-T-A-W, which is gas tungsten arc welding. And finally, S-A-W. This is what your book's talking about. S-A-W is submerged arc welding. So these are the big five. Okay, in cutting, in cutting we have the big three, and the big three are uh, oxyacetylene cutting, 
I think I misspelled that, but <laughs> you get the idea. Oxyacetylene cutting, air, carbon arc cutting, we call it air arc, and then plasma arc cutting. It's abbreviated PAC, plasma arc cutting. So these are the big three types of cutting. Now, most of you already know how to do oxyacetylene cutting. When you get into weld 1760, you'll learn how to do these other two, uh, air carbon arc or air arc and plasma arc cutting. So we offer the, the, all of the major um, processes that are used out there in industry. And today we're going to focus on shielded metal arc welding. Um, there's going to be a question coming out of this paragraph um, on, on welding, on the percentages of welding. Uh, so make sure you read that. And also, uh, SMAW, it has a special place in, in, in the world for, 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 for uh, welding. It says, when looking at the dominant markets using SMAW, 50%, 56% of construction welding is shielded metal arc, and 61% of it is maintenance and repair. So that's its kind of niche. Um, I worked for 13 years in the field, nine years in fabrication shops where we use mostly MIG and, and dual shield. But when you're out there in the field, in power plants, heavy construction, it's usually SMAW and GTAW. So F SMAW is for fabrication of heavy, uh, heavy weldments in, in, in industry, and they also use it for repair. When, if you go to work in any of these mines out here, you may be called upon to do some repair. The, the pad that you build in 1755, that's a repair technique. Okay, So that's one of the things that they use. Skip down to the paragraph where it reads, shielded metal arc electrodes are available to match the properties and strength of most base materials. And in fact, they, they pretty well overmatch. Here's a stick of 6010. Now, the 60 means it has 60,000 pounds of tensile strength once you deposit this weld, once you weld with this. It has 60,000 pounds of tensile strength. When you take a mild steel like this, and, and everything you're welding on in the welding lab is mild steel. M um, mild steel has a tensile strength of about 48,000. So this is higher. It has a greater tensile strength than this does. So it overmatches the base metal. And most welding electrodes will overmatch the base metal. Uh, the single most important thing to remember, and this very well could be a question on your test, is that when you're going to weld, you have to try to, your best to match the filler metal to the base metal. So you want to have the same mechanical property. So you're going to look at the tensile strength, the ductility, the carbon content, and you're going to try to find a welding electrode that comes as close as possible to the thing that you're going to weld. Okay? Let me continue reading. It says, metals most easily welded by the shielded metal arc process are carbon and low alloy steels, stainless steels, and heat resisting steels. Cast iron and the high strength and hardenable types of steel can also be welded provided uh, the proper preheating and post heating procedures are employed. So, as we go along, you'll learn more about procedures. You don't do anything uh, in, in welding as a code welder without some kind of a procedure. And a procedure is nothing more than a written description of how you're going to do it. How hot can it get? Uh, how high can your amperage go? How low can your amperage go? These are all elements that they call them essential variables that will be in a welding procedure. And it's the same thing if you have to preheat something or, or, or heat it after it's welded to relieve the stresses. They are, they're special techniques and there'll be a procedure for, all, for how to do all of those. Uh, you, you're never left to guess when you're a code welder. There's always something written down someplace. Okay. Um, this is what we have in your book. This is at the uh, this is figure 11-1 in our new book. Uh, here we have our base metal, and he here's the surface of the metal, and this is the depth of penetration. And here are, is our consumable electrode, and of course an electrode is something that carries electricity, and when you're doing shielded metal arc welding, uh, that electrode is burnt up as, as it's carrying that electricity. It's designed that way. There are non-consumable electrodes, but we use those in gas tungsten arc welding and plasma arc welding. So this is going to be consumed as it's being used up. It has an electrode coating on it, which we'll discuss in chapter 12. A core wire, this core wire has, a, just like mild steel, that core wire has a 48,000 pound tensile strength. It only rises up to 60,000 pounds or 70,000 pounds after the weld is made. 
And what happens is all the alloying elements that are in this coating mix with the metal and they blend together to, to give it the, the, the final metal properties. Here we have a, a, a kind of a, a schematic of what the shielding would look like, the shielding atmosphere to protect this from the air. This is your arc welding pool. And then on top of here we have a, a, some slag that's solidifying. Different types of electrodes will produce different thicknesses of slag. The two you're learning in this class, 17, uh, pardon me, uh, 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 7018 and 6010, if you welded some of those already, you can see the difference in the thickness of the slag. And um, of course, we'll discuss that more in, in chapter 12, and I'll work with you individually in the welding booth about it. Now, let's see. This is also in your book. This is figure 11.2 in the new book. And I always take new students over the welding diagram, and, and I, I'll show you just a, let me, let me go forward just a second here. I will, I will talk to you about it on, a, on, on one of our welding machines. Here's a picture of one of our welding machines. So these are our inverters, these are what we use, and right here you read your amperage, and here you read your open circuit voltage. Here's your amperage, here's your open circuit voltage. We're looking face on to it here. And we have, you'll see it's got a plus sign, and a minus sign. And you can see them here, plus sign and minus sign. Well, let's go back. Now, if you look here, this is a diagram of the welding circuit. So, if our electrode holder here is hooked up to the plus side, and our work is hooked up to the minus side, we'll get about two-thirds greater heat at the tip of the electrode than if we were to reverse them. If this were the negative side, the straight line, and this was the positive side, we would only have about one-third of the heat. Now, the heat in that arc can get up to 10,000 degrees, so it's a significant difference in, in heat. When you're welding on electrode positive, you, you generate six to 7,000 degrees right there, but if it's on electrode negative, you're down around three or 4,000, so it's very important in the welding circuit. So we have AC, DC, uh, uh, and, and on DC, we can have DC positive or DC reverse. So if we have, now this, this, I took this from gas tungsten arc just to illustrate. This is DCEN, direct current, DC stands for direct current, EN means electrode negative, meaning that if this is hooked up to my welding machine on the negative side, I'm running electrode negative. And you always think straight line, straight polarity. It's also called straight polarity, so I'm on straight polarity. And this illustrates how the electrons flow when, you're, when, when the, the polarity is negative. And it's, and it's showing that, that uh, the, the penetration characteristics, it is deep and narrow on this. And here, if we're going electrode positive, uh, we have about 30% of the work uh, at, the, at the end of the electrode, and 70% is at the end of the electrode, the other is at the work. This is the work down here. And here, the, the penetration is shallow and wide. And then if we go, and this, you have to remember, this is an AC. The, I mean, this is in gas tungsten arc as well, uh, not, not SMAW. If you're doing AC here, the electrons flow in a balance. Uh, there's something called um, um, a sine wave. And let me briefly show you what a sine wave is. In electricity, there's, there's something called a sine wave. In the United States, all the electricity that is generated in the United States is generated at 60 cycles a second meaning that it goes back and forth between, between DC positive and DC negative. It cycles back and forth 120 times a second is what it is. Uh, but it takes uh, 60, sec uh, 60 of them in, in, in a full second to complete that turn, to complete that loop. So it's changing 120 times per second, but it, it's one full loop every 60 seconds. Or, pardon me, 60, 60 times uh, every second. It's called, it's called a cycle. Now, when we, when we have this, it's cycling back and forth between positive and negative. That's called AC. That is called AC, or AC stands for alternating current. Alternating current because it's passing, jumping back and forth between the positive and the negative. So it's, it's, it's balanced. It's, it's half and half, alternating between these two. If we're doing DC electrode positive, then that means this part's cut off. DC electrode positive, we're only getting the direct current side and, and positive polarity, and that's where we get about two-thirds of our heat. If, however, we're doing DC negative, that side is cut off, 
and we're getting about two thirds of our heat, uh, pardon me, one third of our heat on this side. So that's how, that's how the uh, different polarities work. And you're going to want to remember those, and then you will have them on a test. So let me read from your book real quick, where it says operating principles. It says, shielded metal arc welding equipment sets up an electric circuit that includes the welding machine, the work, the electric cables, the electrode holder, and the electrodes and, and a work clamp. The heat of the electric arc brings the work to, the weld, to be welded and the consumable electrode to a molten state. The heat of the arc is intense. Temperatures as high as 5,000 degrees have been measured at its center. So you want to highlight that. You're going to get a question or two on different polarities. So you want to remember DCEN, DCEP. Uh, uh, there's actually four ways you can write it. We can go DCEN for electronegative, DCSP, meaning straight polarity. Then we can go DCRN, pardon me, RP. Uh, direct current reverse polarity, and then we go D, C, E, P. Did I do that right? I did. Yeah, I thought so. I just confused myself there. That's the four ways it can be written. Any questions on, on that or the importance of that? I, I, I've told this story to, 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 to most of my beginning welders and it's true. I, I do a lot of welding inspection and I've gone out on welding jobs and I've had people come up to me and say, boy, Les, my machine's running funny today. And I asked them if they checked the polarity and they don't, they don't understand what I mean. They didn't get this. They didn't learn this in school or nobody ever taught them this. And the thing is, if, it, if somebody came in during the night shift and switch your, switched your welding leads, let's just go back here real quick. These welding leads right here, you can change the pol polarity simply by switching these. Un unplug it from there, put it over there. Unplug that one from there, put it over there. Now you've gone from reverse polarity to straight polarity. And they have to, they have to use straight polarity to do TIG welding. And so if somebody comes on, in on the night shift and, and flips them and you come in and try to weld, your machine's going to sound funny. It's going to run funny. And you're going to go, wow, something's wrong with this. First thing you do is you pick, up, you pick up your electrode holder and you trace it back to your machine. And you always think straight line, straight polarity. So you can check that. Don't ever get fooled by that because it will happen to you during your welding career. Okay, any questions? Nope, okay. All right, so now... Uh, yeah, you will get a question on, on which side produces the greatest amount of heat and things of that nature, so be aware of that. Let's see, drop down to where it says, the welding arc, the arc welding process requires enough electric current, which is measured in amperes, to produce melting of the work and the metal electrode and the proper voltage, which is measured in volts, to maintain the arc. Depending on the size and type, electrodes require 17 to 45 volts and approximately 100 to 500 amps. Uh, the current can be alternating or direct, but it must be provided through a source that can be controlled to meet the many conditions um, encountered on the job. A lot of you, I've, I've, I've discussed pers uh, individually about how, how electricity flows, and I like to use the idea, the visual image of your water in your yard, and the current, when they say current here, what that is, it's the amount of electricity flowing, which is measured in amps, okay? So if they're talking about current and amps, you can almost use those terms interchangeably. So if, if, you're, if you water in your yard, the water's going to go out a couple feet, splash on the ground, make a big puddle. If you put a spray nozzle on the end of that hose, same amount of water will squirt out 12 or 15 feet. And that's what the voltage does, right? You may get questions on, on that relationship. So the voltage puts puts the amperage under pressure and that's what makes it move along the line. So here it's important that the 17 to 45 volts, that's the amount of pressure that we have pushing, pushing the electricity. So in the welding circuit what that means is the greater the voltage behind that, the deeper it's going to penetrate into the base metal. Okay, And on your machines there's a fine voltage control that you can change if you don't think you're getting enough, uh, enough penetration. Drop down to where it says, welding power sources are also known as power supplies and welding machines. All machines may be classified, uh, classed as an, uh, by the output slope. 
as to whether they're a constant current or a constant voltage. Uh, and also number two, the power source type, such as a transformer, transformer rectifier, inverter, or generator. There's, there's a lot of different types of, of power supplies. We'll talk about them here in a second. Uh, on, on the machines, let me go back here to this visual real quick. On these machines, you can see right here on the, on the face, it says CC, CC. That stands for constant current. Here it says 304, that means it's put, it can put out as much as 300 amps of constant current voltage. When you're welding with constant current, it means that the amperage, remember current means the electricity that's flowing along the line, right? Well, it's a constant current because whatever you do with this welding rod, if you, if you allow it to burn away from the metal like this, the voltage is going to go up to try to push that electricity across this gap. And if you, start burn, if you hold it closer, the voltage is going to drop because it doesn't take as much to go across that gap because the gap is shorter. So that's why it's a constant current because the voltage is always changing in order to keep that current, that current flow, the same. That's why they call it a constant current machine. If you're doing MIG or you're doing flux, uh, flux core, it's going to be it's just the opposite. You're going to use a constant voltage power supply as opposed to a constant current. It just flips them. Okay? Okay. So this is this is what's called a, what is called a VA curve, uh, voltage and amperage. This is it, this is on your book. It's Figure 11.3. I'm only going to going to cover it because it's it, it, it is in your book. On this scale, we have the voltage. Now up here, OCV means open circuit voltage, open circuit voltage. And if you look at your machines, oops, sorry, went the wrong way. If you look at that machine, voltage, this is open circuit voltage, 94.2 open circuit, 86 open circuit. That's what, that means the amount of electricity that's available before you strike the arc. Once you strike the arc, it drops down to these ranges. So if you're long arcing, it'll be somewhere around 30, 32. If you have a short arc, it's somewhere around 22. So it's constantly changing as that welding electrode is being consumed. Uh, along here, you look at your current. So the current it measured in amperages, uh, here they're showing us a range of, of 40 amps and this machine is striving to keep it right here and because it is a constant current no matter what you're doing with that it'll keep it within 15 amps of what you're trying trying to do um, with your with your welding rod so open circuit voltage once you strike the arc and it starts to flow drops down to here and arc length is is going to uh, long arc normal arc short arc Whatever you do with that, this machine is going to try to keep it right there where you, wherever you have it set. And here, the, the setting that they have here for our analysis is 125 amps at 27 volts. So that's what a volt ampere curve looks like. Uh, you may get a question as to what is a volt ampere cur curve. It may be a true false. It may be a multiple choice. I don't think I'll give you a fill in the blank on it, but it could be one of those things. Uh, constant current. Now, I just talked about this. It, it, as the arc voltage drops, the arc current rises. As they, as the, this is just basically what I went over. As the, as the electro burns away, the voltage is going to jump up so that it maintains a constant arc. As you come closer, it doesn't take as much voltage and it'll drop down. So uh, this, is, this is exactly what I said right there. This isn't in your book. This is something I take from my welding inspection class. And if any of you go on and you take that class, which is probably the best class that we teach, uh, we'll go over all of this again. Uh, okay, before I move on, let's see. Under types of output slope, um, on the bulleted items it says SMAW and GTAW require a steep output slope from a constant current welding machine. Constant current is necessary to control the stability of the arc properly. GMAW and FCAW require relatively flat output slope from a constant voltage power source to produce a stable arc. So remember that. That's just what I said. Uh, uh, MIG and flux core take a, take a constant voltage machine and stick and TIG take a constant current machine. All right, now let's take a look at some of these um, power sources. Um, here where it says types of power sources, it says engine driven generators, transformers, rectifiers, um, AC transformers, and inverters. 
and then in, and then it starts to talk about them a little more specifically uh, in a, in another page or two. So before we get to that, we're going to cover this. It says um, um, constant current characteristics. Um, go over where it says open circuit and arc voltage. I think I'm missing a slide here. Oh, no, I'm okay. Okay, it says open circuit voltage. We, we talked about that. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Open circuit voltage drops to arc voltage when the arc is struck and the welding load is on the machine. All right, I covered all of that. Uh, flip the page to machines for shielded metal arc welding. This is an engine driven generator. Yeah. This is this is in your book. This is figure 11.6 in the new book, engine driven DC generator. If you look at this, this is the uh, this is the kind of a machine that you'll see in the back of a welder's truck. Okay, these guys, these pipeliners will have this kind of a machine. A lot of them do. Uh, this is a remote control. This is the panel. Uh, this is your fine fine control, and this is where you can change settings in steps. Uh, up here you can see the gas tank nozzle and here's a lifting lug to pick it up. They, they're, they're pretty heavy. Um, it says in your book that these types of engine driven generators are very popular in the field where electric power supply is not readily available. They are typically driven by gasoline or diesel internal combustion engines. Uh, generators used in the field are illustrated in figures 11.6, 11.7, 11 11.8. I'm not sure how many of those I put in here. Uh, here's another. This is put out by Miller. Um, it, it's essentially the same. Here, here's an exhaust. This is called a Bobcat. We have one similar to this in, in the welding lab. I don't think it's quite like that. Then we come to, uh, in your book, we're going to cover controls for engine driven generator. You guys find that? The polarity switch. When we have Remember going back to my little sine wave here, how I said we can we can go to DC positive or DC DC negative, uh, or we can go to AC. Well, what happens is when electricity is coming in, uh, it, it's AC. When it comes into the building, it's AC. Okay. Well, in order to change it to to DC, they have to put it. Remember this term. They have to put it through what's called a rectifier. Okay. It is a rectifier which converts AC to DC. Okay? That, it's, it's that that'll cut off half of that and give us DC. Um, so don't get fooled by where it, where it says polarity switch. Okay? Because uh, I've gotten answers of that, that you use a polarity switch to, to, to switch AC to DC. Well, yeah, but what's it doing? It's, put, it's, it's, it's feeding it through a rectifier. It's actually a rectifier that does it. So reading under polarity switch, it says electrode negative and electrode positive are used in DC welding. When welding with DC electrode negative, abbreviated DCEN, the electrode is connected to the negative terminal of the power source and the work is connected to the positive terminal. When welding is done with DC electrode positive, the electrode is connected to the positive terminal of the power supply and the work is connected to the negative terminal. Uh, the polarity switch, if there is one, changes to either electrode positive or electrode negative. This controls the direction of current flow. In the electron theory, it is said that the flow, from, the flow is from negative to positive. And I think I mentioned that to you. It always goes from the negative side through the system and back to the positive side. Current controls. You're going to get, you're going to get some questions on these, so make sure you're highlighting. It says current controls. The student will better understand the function of the current controls if he or she keeps in mind that the ampere rating can be compared with the amount of water flowing through a pipe. Amperage is the quantity or the amount of current and determines the amount of heat produced at a weld. Voltage is like the pressure behind the water in the pipe. It is a measure of the force of the current. Voltage determines the ability to strike an arc and maintain its consistency. If voltage is too high, the arc is too harsh and may produce arc blow. On the other hand, if it is too low, it is very difficult to maintain the arc. Also, if you turn the voltage up too high, you get an unstable arc and it can cause porosity. So you want to keep that in mind too. Let's see where we're at. Yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Here's talking about current controls. There's there's two types of current controls I want to show you. Uh, this is basically what's called a rheostat, and you could imagine along these three different wires here uh, sheathed like uh, like an extension cord. Okay, and and these things can be really really long, and they're they're usually in a little box. I this is, I couldn't find my old one, so I I found this, which still is the same thing, and. The nice thing about these current controls, you can take it to wherever you're working, and I use them all the time. And you can you can make your adjustments simply by turning this knob. You don't have to go back out to the machine to make your adjustments. You can you can you can put you can set your machine on remote, and then you can go ahead and, and just go and do this in your yeah do this in your uh, whoops going the wrong way. Well, yeah, that's that's perfect. Inside here, uh, there's a little switch that you can change it from remote. To uh, to the panel, and all you have to do is flip that toggle switch to remote, and then you can use this inside where you're working at. Okay, another way to do it is with one of these. These are used a lot uh, for gas tungsten arc welding. Does anybody know what this is? You guys ever seen one of these? I beg your pardon. You, you've seen one? Well, if you guys go on and you learn TIG. You know, uh, TIG you you can use this, and it looks like gas pedal certainly. And you, the more you press it down, the higher the amperage goes. The more you let off, the lower the amperage is. So it gives you really fine current control at an instant. Uh, you, we use these in TIG welding, and using one of these things in a high frequency machine, you can weld razor blades together. Okay, uh, this one it doesn't have such fine control. You have to sit here and you have to change it like by hand. And usually what I'll do is I'll I'll be welding with one hand and I'll sit here and I'll change it with the other hand in order to get it where I want it. But both of these things are very useful to the welder. So these are remote controlled units that you can use. And now they've actually come out with a digital one. Uh, I mean a completely remote one, no wires. And, and you can, they're kind of expensive, but, but you can buy them and you can actually use them to, to adjust your machine. Pretty cool. Okay, let's see. Next. We're on page. 294 in the new book, DC transformer rectifiers. Let's see. This should be figure 11.9. Okay, this is this is a transformer rectifier machine. And let me read. It says the transformer rectifier welding machine. They have many designs and purposes. Flexibility is one reason for their wide acceptance by industry. These machines can deliver either DC electrode negative or DC electrode positive. They may be used for stick welding, gas tungsten arc welding, submerged arc welding, multiple operator systems, and stud welding. This is a bullet. All transformer rectifier machines have two basic parts. A transformer for producing and regulating the alternating current that enters the machine and a rectifier. That's a highlight. A rectifier that converts the alternating current to direct current. Okay. A third important part is a ventilating fan, which keeps it from getting too hot. Blah blah blah. Uh, highlight the last last sentence in uh, the next paragraph. It says transformer rectifiers have no major rotating parts, so they consume little power uh, while they idle and operate quietly. Okay. You guys have that in your book? Un okay. So. What a transformer rectifier machine like this does is it takes it takes line wire coming into the building, and it'll cut it down to the to the to the amount of of uh, power that you need in that machine, and then it will convert it to DC. Okay. Uh, AC DC transformer rectifiers. Let's see. If you look at this, this ought to be familiar to you. If you look at this. We have two of these in, in, in the welding lab. These things are really old, but you know they still work great. And the way you adjust this is you crank this handle, and it, and it moves a bar up, up between two coils, and that's what, that's what adjusts your amperage. And down here, you can read it. And on the top side, this is AC. On the bottom side, this is DC. And if you go in there into the welding lab and you look at the face of one of these machines, you'll see that the top scale goes up to 250, while the bottom scale only goes to 200. And the reason that happens is because when you convert AC to DC, you lose some of it. 
and in this case you lose about 50 amps. About 20% of it is lost in the conversion process. Now I don't know that that's in your book, but it will be a question on the test, okay? Um, but yeah, look at the ones that we have in the, in the welding lab to get an idea. Reading from your book, it says an AC-DC welding machine is used for stick electrode welding and gas tungsten arc welding in which alternating current is required for most non-ferrous metals and direct current is required for stainless steel. The AC-DC welders have the versatility of the DC welder and the special advantages of AC. One of the neat things about AC is, let me, see, let me go ahead, is this, arc blow. I've talked to everybody about arc blow, what it is. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll touch on this a little bit more in a, in a second. You don't get arc blow if you have AC electricity. If you use an AC electricity, it doesn't magnetize the part. That'll be a question on your test. Okay, AC, no arc blow with AC. Okay, let's go back to your book. Um, AC transformer welding machines. The transformer type is the most popular AC welding machine. The function of the transformer is to step down the high voltage of the input current uh, to the high amperage, low voltage current required for welding. Um, the characteristics of AC current are such that there is a reversal of the current every 120th of a second. Uh, this constant re reversal of current keeps the effect of the magnetic field at a minimum, minimum thus reducing magnetic arc blow. Okay? So we don't have it because that current is bouncing back and forth between uh, positive and negative so it doesn't create our magnetic field. So that's the big advantage of using an AC machine. There are disadvantages that outweigh the advantages in my opinion, but that's just my opinion. It says while the arc may be somewhat more difficult to start than one produced by direct current, the absence of arc blow and higher voltage makes the arc easy to hold once it is obtained. Um, this is what we call a cracker box. 1117. I meant to have you put a photo in, photo in before this, but I, I forgot to get it on the list. Um, this is what's called a, 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 a cracker box. You can buy these fairly cheaply. These are AC machines, and it, these will produce 225 amps right here. Uh, but you don't have a fine control. You have, to, you have to click it as you go around that dial. So it's like 85, 100, 125, and so forth. There's no real fine control on that. You know, they're okay if you're going to do some, you know, tack two pieces of steel together, but I wouldn't recommend them for uh, any quality type of welding. Uh, read about the DC and AC-DC inverter machines. That's what we have. Oh, there's my photo, my missing photo. These are AC-DC inverters. These machines will produce 300 amps, and that's as much as this machine will produce. But, well, this machine will weigh about 700 pounds. That machine weighs 88 pounds. Big difference. Inverter technology came along about 15 years ago, and just about all of our welding machines in the welding lab use inverters now. Multiple operator systems. Uh, it says on construction jobs and steel mills and in shipyards it is often necessary for a large number of welders to work within a limited area. You will see these on construction jobs. I see them all the time. People will, will take, take sharpie pens and they'll write their names on here. This belongs to Big Tom and Jerry and this, this is Bob's and, and, and Uncle Roy's and, and by golly you better not mess with their machines. So, and these things have got cables running all over the place. These are, they're eight, there are eight different uh, uh, faces there so you, you can set up eight different welders and it's usually two welders per machine because in the in the real world you're going to be buddy welding you're going to have a partner most of the time and so these machines would have two welders on each one so off of that one little bank of power supplies there 16 welders can go to work okay let's see power supply ratings Okay. Reading under power supply ratings, it says uh, current output. Welding machines are rated on the basis of current output and amperes. I showed you some 300 amps that ours, our machines put out. Uh, amperage ranges are from 200 to 2000. Uh, they can be rated on open circuit voltage. Not so much, but duty cycle is a big one. Put a bullet by 
put a bullet by duty cycle. A duty cycle says the duty cycle is the percentage of any given 10 minute period that a machine can operate at its rated current output without overheating or breaking down. So essentially a duty cycle is a safety switch. If it gets too hot, it's going to shut itself off. Okay, that's its duty cycle. Um, if you're doing submerged arc welding or gas metal arc welding, those are going to have a 100% duty cycle. Uh, some of these other machines, like that and like that, they'll have about a 30% duty cycle. The duty, duty cycle changes. But if you're doing something like this and you're stick rod welding, you have to think, well, I'm always stopping, cleaning, brushing, grinding, changing electrodes. So you're not really running it and they don't get a chance to overheat. But if you're doing submerged arc or gas metal arc where you're just pulling the trigger and you can weld for 20 minutes without stopping, it would overheat. So that's why those have a 100% duty cycle. So duty cycle, you will have a question or two on your test about duty cycles and what their purpose is. Okay. Now, electrode and, and cable work. Um, I'm going to speed up here a little bit because we're running a little late. And mostly I want to do a little bit of show and tell. And here, this is, this is a cable. Pardon me, this is a lug and this is a cable. And looking at your book, let's start with the let's start with the electrode. Okay, this is the uh, this is this is called a whip. Out in the real world, this is called a whip. It's also called a stinger. You want to know those those two terms? If you're out there on the job and you're doing construction and you go up to the tool room and say, um, I need a I need a, an electrode holder cable, they're going to look at you and go, Boy, you're new, aren't you? You would, but if you go up and say, I need a whip or I need a stinger, they're going to ask you, well, how come you don't have your own? <laughs> That's the first thing they're going to ask you because it, it, when, you're, when, when you're working in the real world, you're going to have your own. And you're going to have, a, you're going to have your own little tool bucket. I always did. You carry it from job to job. These are called whips uh, or stingers. And this is your electrode holder. So you're going to have one of these. It'll have a connector on the end. And it can hook either up to the machine or more, more, more probably up to... Uh, up to a cable that comes off of the machine so you can be in your work area. This would be analogous to your, to, your, uh, to your ground clamp. If these cables, if you look at these cables, and I'm looking at, a, at the picture in our book that shows what these cables are made out of, this is copper, and of course with the price of copper, three to four bucks a, a pound now, this stuff's pretty valuable, but it's got a lot of ductility, and you can see there's thousands of little tiny uh, wires in there, and that's what carries your electricity. The more electricity you're going to carry, the more little tiny wires you're going to have in there. Um, so the, it's, it, and the, they talk about that in your book, the, the greater the amperage. And also, let me read from your book. It says, the amperage of the welding machine and its distance from the work are important considerations when selecting the size of the welding cable. Here's a bullet. The greater the amperage and the greater the distance between the work and the welding machine, the larger the cable size must be. Okay, so you may get a question on that. It says it may overheat. So watch out about that. Read that. Uh, so you want to keep your work as close uh, to the machine as possible. And now finally let me talk about these lugs. Uh, this picture should be in your book. This is a lug. Uh, this is a new type of lug that they've come out with. You can see it's got a little tit on the end of it there and that's for hitting it with a hammer. What you would do with your cable, if I had this cable and I was, and, and uh, Mary in our tool room will do this. She, she put, puts these together all the time. She'll twist this like this, and then these, they, these little kits come with a little piece of copper like this, and you wrap it around it, like so, and then you slide it into, into the lug, and then you take, take this and put it on a flat surface, and you hit this with a hammer, and it pinches it. And that's, that's how they hold them together. Now, here's one that was manufactured and it was put in a press, and you can see it's got a little dimple in there where this one was pressed. So it's two different types of lugs that they use. Uh, and here's a third type. This type of lug here would actually hook up to your welding machine. There's nuts coming off the welding machine. And then your cables would simply go into, would simply go into the welding machine, into these. And they would twist, and now they're hooked up. So these are three different types of lugs that, that they have. Uh, let's see. Ground clamps. I brought some, brought some different ground clamps to illustrate the different amperages. These were the ones that, that 
are, are going to be mostly in the welding lat that you're going to see. These are small, lightweight. Uh, they've got a nice little grip on them. Uh, but if you're using higher amperages, then you're going to have to switch to Big Brother. And you can see this one, this one would carry more amperage. You could work farther from your machine. Um, so this is just a, a scaled up version of that. If you're welding on pipe, on pinwheel, and it's rolling around and around and around, well, you, you don't want it to get tangled up, so you would use this kind of a clamp. It's kind of a clamp that would spin as you're, as you're spinning your pipe, um, so it can rotate. So these are very popular. You see those in fabrication shops a lot. Um, let me see. Quick connects. These are these are quick connects. This should be you should have a picture of this in your book. Uh, this would be called a male end. This would be a female end. They simply slip in together and and they twist to lock in place. And uh, positive and negative. This would uh, you, you would have these for positive and negative on your welding machines. Uh, let me see. Quick connects electrode holders. Okay, electrode holders. First of all, here's our standard electrode holder. Uh, this is what you're using. It's got grooves in it to put your welding electrode in at different angles. This one is called a Bernard electrode holder. This one works by twisting the handle, putting your electrode in there, and then tightening the handle. Two different types. It's called a Bernard because that's the manufacturer. Um, one other thing I wanted to show you. We were talking about higher amperages. If you're actually welding, here's the big brother to this one. So you can see that electrode holders come in different sizes too. If you're, weld if you're on a job where you're having to use this kind of electrode holder, and let's say this kind of welding rod, my advice would be to get another job. This is called gorilla welding. You don't want to be working with this kind of stuff. Uh, but this, do, this does work great if you're doing air arcing because you're going to have to use about 400 amps if you're doing air arcing, which is air carbon arc, which I will teach you as we go along. Um, let me see. Hoods. Okay. In your book, you should have some pictures of, of hoods. This is, a, this is a standard hood. These have been around forever. Uh, got a little view screen. I use one of these for, for all of my, my active welding career. They didn't have electronic hoods at that time. Um, you may also see hoods like this that have a bigger view uh, finder. They'll have a plastic lens in there. Uh, make sure that you're wearing safety glasses to grind, even if you have these plastic lenses. I, I, I saw a bad thing happen one, one time. A guy didn't have safety glasses on and, and his grinding disc sh fell apart and it went through there and it shattered and it blinded him for the rest of his life. So. Make sure that you have, have your safety lenses in there and your safety glasses on. Um, and then in the welding lab, we provide these. This is an electronic hood. And you can, you can have settings of, you can, you can grind, you can uh, cut, you can weld with this and, and different, different settings for that. Uh, these are loners. You have to check them out and check them back in. This is the exact same kind of hood that Marion, uh, pardon me, that Jeff Brager and I use. Uh, they run about 350 bucks. Uh, let's see. So there's the rotating clamp, quick connects, electrode holder. This is a blow up with what an electrode holder looks like. And in my view, this part right here is the most important part of the electrode holder. It's your insulator. These insulators, you can see it right here, these insulators get worn. And if they get worn, uh, they can arc out. So check your insulators. Sometimes the screws that hold the insulators in place, they get burnt. Um, and they can get damaged real easy. So check, check your insulators every day before you start to weld. And if there's any question that they're, that they're not safe, turn them in and let's get them fixed. Uh, let's see. That's what they look at, look like apart. That's the inside of a Bernard Stinger. I'm not going to take it apart because I'm running a little behind. Standard hood, uh, an electronic hood, brings us to safety, safety glasses, 
and uh, there, there'll be a question on safety glasses. This came, this slide came out of my inspection class, but let me read something from your from the from the part on safety. It says safety glasses can absorb more than 99.9% .9 of harmful ultraviolet rays that can cause sunburn. Okay. The lenses are usually made out of high impact polycarbonate material and must beat ANSI Z87.1 standards. Okay? Going to have a question on that. So different types of, of face protection, head protection, hearing protection, eye protection. Okay. Next we come to more lugs. <laughs> uh, clothing. Protective clothing, uh, you should, I thought I had a picture in here, maybe we missed it, uh, of, of a guy all decked out in, in proper clothing. You should have sturdy boots, no laces, clean clothes, wool is best, treated cotton's acceptable, but you don't want any synthetics, no polyester, because it'll melt, melt to your skin. Uh, you don't want any cuffs on your pants, uh, you want to keep your, your, your boots inside your pants. Um, you should have flaps on your shirt pockets where you should have a, a cap, gloves, and leathers. And you don't want your pants to be frayed. If I see anyone coming into class and they've got, they've got frays, you know, they've got holes in their jeans and frays because it's styling or whatever, you know, I'm not going to let you weld unless you put duct tape over that stuff. That stuff can catch on fire. Um, let's see. Fume protection. This is on the, this is, we're almost done. It says, always use proper ventilation. When welding, keep your head out of the fume plume. It rhymes. It will be on a test. Fume plume. If this is not possible, use a fume extractor. Um, the most important factor in avoiding fumes during welding is in the position of the welder's head. Keeping the head out of the fume plume will avoid breathing the vast majority of the fumes created. Fumes are fine particulate matter. You breathe them in, they're going to go into your lungs. They can kill you over time. If you're welding with stainless steel and you smell something sweet, that means you're smelling the chromium that gives stainless steel its corrosion resistant properties. They call it the sweet smell of death. Keep your head out of the fume plume. Most important thing you can do. Um, and here's what SMAW welding equipment looks like. Uh, the advantage, okay, now, now we're, we're done with your book, so you can close your book, but you're going to have to take some notes on this. Now I'm going to go through this real, real briefly because we're at 55 minutes and I wanted to keep this under an hour. So the advantages of SMAW, it's simple equipment, it's inexpensive, it's portable, and you can weld most alloys with it. Those are some of the advantages. Limitations, it's relatively slow. It's a lot slow. We talked about how you have to change your rods and brush the slag and grind and all that stuff. So it's a little slow. You have to take off the slag. There are electrode storage considerations, which we'll get into in the next chapter. Arc blow, well, we've talked about arc blow already and I've, and, and I've talked to you about it in your booth. Arc blow can be very, very uh, serious. Discontinuities. Now, as I said at the beginning of this, we have discontinuities and defects. Uh, all defects are discontinuities, but not all discontinuities are defects. Uh, a discontinuity could be porosity or slag or spatter or incomplete joint penetration or incomplete fusion. What that means is these are all things that could go wrong with your weld. And if, and if too much of that goes wrong, now your weld can be rejected. So these are some of the things that SMAW could cause. So it's, it's good, but you have to be careful of these things. Here's what incomplete fusion looks like in a, in a diagram. What you're doing, you're doing these kind of welds here, and this is real, this happens a lot. Incomplete fusion at the, at the toe, pardon me, at the, uh, at the root, uh, sidewall incomplete fusion, and incomplete fusion here on this side. Um, with fillet welds, it's not too, too prevalent. This is a picture of what it looks like. Right here you can see that this person failed to break that down. It's incomplete fusion. Inclusions. Slag inclusions. If you trap slag in your weld, 
then that's an inclusion. So that's one of the things. Here's a picture of some. Look at the sl the, these slag inclusions. Those are some of the things that can go wrong with, with shielded metal arc welding. Porosity. This is, this is a big one. You probably see a lot of this. It's defined as a cavity type discontinuity formed by gas. What happens is if you lose your shielding or your, or your long arcing, air can get to the liquid metal. And when it does, it'll absorb that and then it looks like a sponge. Your weld will look like a sponge. That's porosity. That's a big one. S scattered surface porosity. Here you can see all this dif these different spots of porosity where hydrogen got to the weld. This is isolated surface porosity. Again, you can see all of these holes. Now this is one that, that was so bad that it caused a crack right down the middle of the weld using chiseled metal arc welding. This is an x-ray of what it looks like. You've got a little bit here, a little bit there, there, there. Uh, it, it gets a lot worse over in this end. This, could, this may or may not be an acceptable weld. Um, you're allowed a little bit but you're not allowed a lot. This would not be an acceptable weld. This is called cluster porosity. And that's just too much in too small an area, so this would not be acceptable. Undercut, this is a big one for people in, in 1755. It's a groove melted into the base metal adjacent to the weld toe or weld root and left unfilled by weld metal. Um, I'm sure I pointed it out to you. You can pretty well judge it for yourself. If you can hook your fingernail on it, it's too much. This is what it looks like. Undercut here, undercut on the back side there. This is uh, uh, what it looks like on a, on a, uh, on a weld. To look for, extra, uh, for undercut, you shine a flashlight at an angle, coming in at an angle so, it'll so that the undercut will cast a shadow. Overlap, the protrusion of weld metal beyond the weld toe or the weld root. Here's overlap, where it's running down See, it, it's, it's, it didn't burn into this metal. It's just laying there. It's just laying there. It's just laying there. That's overlap. That's a defect it, because it's called a stress riser. And here's pictures of overlap. And fillet weld convexity. This is a, a, when it's rounded like this, that's called convexity. You're allowed a little bit, but not too much. So you want to keep these as flat as you possibly can. Arc strikes. Arc strikes can, go, can cause cracks. This is a picture. This is a blow up of an arc strike. Look at these cracks. Try not to get, to, to get arc strikes on your material. Spatter. Everybody knows what spatter is. Here's a picture of spatter that caused a crack. Spatter can be bad. Okay, I, went, I ran through those pretty, pretty fast. You're probably going to get a couple of questions on them. Uh, but I'm not going to give you real technical questions on that. But I'm going to say, what's spatter? And you're going to tell me. You're, I'm going to say, what's porosity? And you're going to, you don't have to give me the book, textbook definition. Just a, just a pretty good idea that I, under, that I know that you understand what those things are.